So of course I'm sure you're all very familiar with the, the symptoms of autism, so this is how they're laid out in the, the latest US diagnostic manual, um, so difficulties with social communication and restricted and repetitive behaviours. And of course we know a lot about that in, in children, in adults with autism, but we're really interested in how these difficulties emerge in, in very early development. And of course we know that there's a lot of variability within individuals with autism, so some will experience some symptoms and not others. There's a lot of different associated conditions, so of course some people with autism experience anxiety or depression or attention problems. Um, and so that's, that's one of the things that we're very interested in, is not only how the core symptoms of autism emerge, but how some of these other associated difficulties might uh, emerge in early development also. So, so as we know, by, by sort of four or five, um, and now we think by two or three really, we can see a lot of the core symptoms present for, for many individuals. Of course, diagnosis might not be made then, but, but we know that a lot of the difficulties are often apparent by, by early childhood. But as I'll talk about, it's becoming much more clear that the, the risk factors for autism, so the sort of ultimate genetic or environmental differences that might lead to autism are generally present prenatally or very soon postnatally. So there's a big gap between when those risk factors occur and when we make a diagnosis of autism or when we see those clear behaviours that, that we can identify in children. And we're really interested in, in this period because we think that in terms of early intervention, that, that might be a time of... of what we call sort of ultimal pl plasticity, so a time where we can provide early interventions that support very early uh, development and might make a difference in terms of the emergence of those behaviours in, in early development. Of course, we know that the, the prevalence of autism, so at least the rate at which we identify autism, is going up. So a lot of that will be better identification, but it means that there's, there's more individuals with autism who are identified as potentially needing support. And I think this data is from 2004, but I don't think the picture's changed hugely, that, that a lot of adults with autism report that their quality of life can be limited. So many adults with autism don't live independently or, or hold on jobs. Of course, lots do. There's a big, big variability, but there's still a substantial number of adults with autism who perhaps would appreciate support in, in reaching more optimal outcomes for them. And so this is the kind of the background motivation for us in, in trying to focus on early development and try to understand where these symptoms come from and how we might be able to provide some earlier interventions to, to prevent the more negative symptoms from emerging. So really we have three ultimate goals in a lot of what we do. Firstly, we're interested in, to a lesser extent, the sort of background risk information, so genetics of autism, environmental factors, mainly so that they can help us both understand the, the sort of mechanisms underlying symptom emergence, but also we can identify people who might be infants who might be at heightened risk um, that might need more developmental monitoring. But our group mainly fo focuses on these second two goals, so developing better ways of early screening, early identification or surveillance, so ways of identifying infants who might be at risk for going on to develop autism, and then ultimately being able to provide better options for intervention for families who, who want it. So that's kind of our, our background set of goals. So in terms of how we, how we actually do that, there's been a number of different approaches adopted. So traditionally, a lot, a lot of work in this area has been done by, by parent reports, so asking parents how their infants developed, what kind of symptoms they noticed first, how old their child was when they first started becoming concerned. And we've learned a lot from that about uh, some of the early, early behavioral signs of autism. And some of, some of the data that I'll talk about really comes out of this original literature um, in terms of what parents first noticed and when they noticed it. And so we've known for a long time that, that parents say that they generally first become concerned around 12 to 18 months, and then there's this big gap until they actually receive a diagnosis of autism for their child, often around five, six, seven, or, or later. Um, and of course, this, this approach has got lots of strengths, but one of the challenges of, of memory is that memory isn't always that accurate. Um, so when people have, have looked at it, this is some data from a sample where they asked parents of kids with autism when they remembered their child first using language. And so when they asked the parent when the kid was two, they said around you know, 15 to 18 months, depending on what group the kid was in. And then when they asked the parents when the kids were nine, parents remembered it being more like three, three and a half. So there are definitely memory biases that creep in um, that make it difficult sometimes to interpret precise timing from some of these, these retrospective studies. So partly because of that, um, there was a, a sort of new wave of research using videotapes. So now that lots of parents have videotapes, we can ask parents to, to give us the tapes of their babies when they were younger. 
and then we can look at what differences there might be between the videotapes from babies who the videotapes of kids who now have autism when they were babies versus those who are typically developing. And often these are kind of things like first birthday videotapes because the, the setting's a bit more constrained and we can look for sort of certain behavioral features. And so this research has looked at things like eye contact, babies responding to their names, pointing, gestures, so some of the sort of more classic early signs of autism. Um, and again, this has proven very informative in terms of when, when we start to see delays in some of these very overt behaviors. And one thing that this has been really important in is in demonstrating that indeed, as, as people have been telling us for a long time, about 30% of kids do experience a regression. Um, so they were able to take uh, tapes from, from babies whose parents said that you know, later on they'd lost skills and they, the researchers were able to show that indeed those babies had been smiling and making eye contact and talking um, and then those skills were lost between then and, and when they were assessed in, in childhood. So it's been really important for, for understanding that. But again, of course, we're, we're limited to observable behaviour. So just like with asking, asking parents or caregivers, the early videotapes can only show us what the child can do. And really what we're interested in is, is that, but also why the child might be showing different behaviours in the first place. So what's different in the brain, or what's different in terms of how they're processing the environment. Because understanding that might help us figure out how to either change the environment or give the children additional skills that might help them um, optimise their developmental trajectories. So because of that sort of, that progression of research, now what we've been doing in, um, in our London centre and what a lot of people across the US have been doing and increasingly in Europe is working with what we call high risk populations. And so predominantly these are infants who have older siblings with autism because we know that, um, well, we've known for a while that autism runs in families. So if you have an older sibling with autism, you have about a 10 to 20% chance of developing autism yourself. And so in this design, what we do is work with families with an infant who has an older sibling with autism, and we follow them from early in infancy through to age two, three, four, or beyond. Um, and around age three, we can usually make a, a relatively stable diagnosis of autism in those children who, who meet criteria. And so then what we can do is then look back at their earlier development to see what might be different in the infants who went on to receive an autism diagnosis versus those who didn't. And what, what we find from putting together large amounts of this early data, um, particularly from the US groups, is that it does work out about 20% of those infants at age three meet criteria for autism. Um, and we're starting now to follow up children a little bit older, and that doesn't necessarily, and what we're finding is that the children who meet criteria at three don't always still meet criteria at seven or eight. So some of them have what looks like early autism that maybe then attenuates, um, maybe they have successful intervention, it's hard to say. But broadly, for the majority of children, that's a relatively stable diagnosis. And then we're comparing our what we call high-risk infants to low-risk infants, so infants with an older sibling with typical development who have the risk of anybody in the population, slightly lower. So about 1% um, of those infants will develop autism. And so then by using this prospective design, where we're following them sometimes from pregnancy, but certainly from um, very early after birth, through to age three, we can learn about not only behavioral development, but also what's changing in the brain over that time and what might predict these later symptoms um, emerging. And we hope that by doing that, if we can find changes in the brain or changes in cognition that, that predict later behavioral symptoms, they might be early red flags that, that could um, promote entry into an early intervention program. So now I'm just gonna talk a bit about what we've learned from the studies that we've been doing, but also um, other people's work in this area. So just a, a quick um, note on background risk to start with. So we know that there's a lot of genetic influence in autism <coughs> and the estimates go up and down, but, but broadly there's, there's a substantial amount of autism risk probably that comes from genetic variation. So we know that a small number of kids with autism have autism that's associated with a genetic condition. So something like uh, tubular sclerosis, or neurofibromatosis, that are sort of single gene pretty much conditions that have lots of developmental effects, but one of the consequences can be autism. So that's given us some information about what kind of genes might be involved in some of the networks that are implicated in autism, but actually the vast majority of cases of autism aren't associated with um, single genes, either single gene disorders or other types of single gene mutation. 
So we think that a lot of the risk is coming from common variation that happens to coalesce in some families um, and that creates risk for autism through the combination of lots of smaller genetic risk factors. And so this is just some data from um, the US consortium. So there's a big US consortium um, that we're part of too that, that studies infant siblings and we put all of the data together so we can ask more powerful questions. This is from about 3,000 infants with older siblings with autism. Um, but if you look at the white bars, those are infants with more than one older sibling with autism. And then the gray bars are infants with only one older sibling. And so you can see that the rate of autism is much higher if an infant's got more than one older sibling. Which suggests again that there's a, a sort of higher familial load, as it were, in those families. And I know that last time uh, Simon talked about gender differences, and of course that comes out in our um, data sets too, that if you're a male infant, you've got a much higher risk than if you're a female infant. Although interestingly, in some of these prospective studies, we don't get such a big gender difference as, as you do in, in studies of diagnosed individuals, which might be to do with some of the, the diagnostic biases that are out there in terms of failing to identify autism in girls. Or it might be something about the early age. We don't know, but we still do see some gender difference. So then in terms of genetics of autism, I'm not gonna really talk about it, but, but what we're trying to do now, what the field's trying to do is kind of group the genes associated with autism into different functions. And so it comes out with things like kinase activation or things about cell signaling or neurons communicating with each other. So there's all the sort of very domain, general, broad functions um, that seem to be impacted by a lot of the genes that are associated with autism. And so this is kind of what the, the way the field's going at the moment is to identify these clusters. Um, but there's also, to some extent, environmental effects. So the things that are probably most reliably associated are things like pregnancy complications, but only to a very small degree. So all these things might raise risk from 1% to 1.5% or 2%. They're not big effects, but there's an association that comes out across some repeated studies. So pregnancy complications, birth complications. Of course, whether that's environmental or whether that's a vulnerable baby having difficulty being born, we don't really know. Um, but the one thing that probably is environmental is prenatal infection is again associated with a slightly increased risk of autism. And so some infections like rubella, the, the, the bigger infections are associated with a much bigger risk, but things like the flu or milder infections can also be associated very slightly. So there is a degree in which the environment is contributing and probably an interaction with genetics. So a vulnerable infant might be more susceptible to environmental influences than another, another baby would be. But what we're interested in really is how these sort of prenatal or early postnatal environmental and genetic differences result in the behaviours we see later on in development. And so we know from a lot of work in, in typical development that there's interactions between all these sort of levels of analysis, as it were, over time. So the baby is developing, and as the baby develops, they learn new behaviours, they might have individual differences in those behaviours. So some babies are easy, some are hard, some sleep, some don't. And that all elicits different behaviour from the people around them, but it also exposes them to different environments. And so those environments then affect baby's brain development, baby's brain activity. And we know that brain activity in the environment also affects genetics. So it affects how genes are switched on and off, which might then affect whether or not the variant that you've got is actually having any impact on your behavior or not. So there's lots of interactions over time that ultimately for children with autism end up in this pattern of symptoms. But we're trying to understand the pathways that, that take infants from those genetic environmental risk factors to those ultimate behaviors. And so the studies that we do are these prospective studies of infants with older siblings, and we do a whole variety of measures to try and understand all those different levels. So we measure genetics and, and epigenetics, so which genes are switched on and off using saliva samples. We see infants' behavior over developmental time, so both looking at um, videos of babies and coding their behaviors, but also using eye tracking to look at how they're taking in information about the world. And then we look at their brain development. So we use scanning to look at structural brain development. This one, there's an optical imaging system there. So we shine very weak light into baby's brain that can tell us which part of the brain are more active for different stimuli. We use EEG, so brain activation. And we also look at heart rate and skin conductance so we can understand how babies are responding to their environment, how stressed they might be, which, which things draw their interest and which don't. And then finally, we look at their environment, so both their physical environment, but also the people that they interact with and how their parents are responding to them and how they're responding to their parents. 
So we're trying to build up quite a broad picture of, of that developmental period and how those symptoms are emerging. Okay, so what have we learned? Well, I'm going to start by talking about social attention because this is one of the things that has got a lot of surface validity as being important in early autism. So we know that the kids with autism often don't, um, don't seem to be very interested in people. Some kids with autism don't. They might not turn in response to their name. They might not look at people as much. Um, and so one of the theories right from the beginning was that, well, maybe, maybe these babies who go on to autism aren't looking at people, aren't paying attention to people. And so they're not taking in information about their social world. That prevents them from learning. And that's why you see this sort of um, gradual emergence of all these difficulties in social communication. And there have also been arguments that maybe that also contributes to restricted interest. So if infants aren't interested in the social world, maybe they become more interested in objects and more repetitive things they can control. Um, so this has been something that a lot of our work and other people's work has been, has been looking at in early infancy. And the first, the first aspect of social attention that there was a lot of um, attention to was what we call social orienting. So this is how, just how often babies look at people or look at the caregivers, listen to their name. Um, and so the, the expectation was that maybe there'd be a failure of this right, right from the beginning. But actually we find, if anything, the opposite. So, so this is some data from Sally Ozanoff's group in the US. So this is a, a task where infants sit opposite an experimenter and the experimenter gives them um, things to play with, basically. And she's actually testing their motor skills and their cognitive skills. But at the same time, the researchers coded how often the baby looked at the examiner in that situation. And what they found was that in red are the infants with later autism, that at six months, the infants who went on to autism at age three actually looked much more at the examiner's face than the typically developing infants did. And then what we saw over that six to 36 month period is that they just gradually decline in their tendency to orient to the, to the person. So they're just showing a gradual loss of skill or at least a, a reduction in the tendency to be interested in engaging with the person that they're, they're interacting with. So it was very different, I think, to what everybody expected, but it really fits with these ideas of, of regression and loss of skill. This is what a lot of parents were telling us, that the kids right in the beginning were very sociable, and then over time they seem to withdraw. So we see a very similar thing if we use eye tracking. So here we're showing babies videos of women. Um, this is Army Clins group in the US. And so the eye tracker can tell which part of the face the baby's looking at. So here we're interested in how often babies look at the eyes, because Obviously the eyes are a source of a lot of important social information, whether or not someone's looking at you, whether they're drawing your attention to something. And again, they were expecting that because children and adults with autism often don't look as much at the eyes as typically developing people, they're expecting they'd do that in babies too. But actually this is between two and six months, and in, again, the kids with later autism were in red. So at two months, the infants with later autism actually spent a lot more time looking at the eyes than, than other infants did. And then there was this drop between two and six months that carried on declining right through age 24 months, so that by age two, they were looking much less at the eyes than, than typical kids were, which is what we expected from, from older kids and adults. So again, there's this really interesting reversal in very early infancy where infants look like they're, if anything, more interested in looking at people's faces and their eyes, and then over time, that skill disappears. So we don't, we don't exactly know why that is, but one, one possibility is that whilst infants are, are looking at faces and looking at eyes, they're not able to, for whatever reason, process what they're seeing. So maybe it's too complex, too dynamic, maybe they're having trouble engaging attention to it, and so over time they fail to get any reward value from it, or they don't understand what they're seeing, and so their attention drops away. And so we've started to look at more nuanced measures of what's happening while a baby's looking at a face to try and get some um, understanding about that. So this was a study where we're looking at when you show a baby a face, how long do they engage with it and how quickly do they look away? Um, because that can give us a measure both of the information processing but also of their attention engagement. So do they engage with it and spend a long time looking at it or do they just look away really quickly as though they're not really processing it? And what we found is a six month old with autism. autism so being shown a face again and again and again, and we pick the longest look because they're sort of dependent measure. Um, and so on the graph on the right, the infants with later autism again are in red. And what we found that to faces, but not to toys, again, they showed a much shorter look time. So they looked at the face in the first place, but they didn't really engage with it for the same length of time as the typically developing infants did. 
Um, and interestingly, this wasn't there at 12 months, so by 12 months they looked the same as other children. Um, so these might be risk factors, sort of vulnerabilities that we see very early on that, that perhaps fail to reinforce this early social orienting. And then we start seeing this decline subsequently. So we also looked at EEG responses, so brain responses during while the infant were looking at these pictures, so while the infants were looking at faces and objects. Again, to see how sustained the activity was um, and how rapidly uh, the brain responded. And what we found here, so this is red again as infants with later autism, um, particularly over the left side, that we saw quite rapid responses in the beginning, but it, it fell off quite quickly. So that left hand graph with the peaks um, shows that the brain activity really fell off much more rapidly in the infants with later autism than other infants, which again might suggest that they're failing to sustain activation or sustain attention to, to these face stimuli. So that's one, one possibility for why um, they might be interested in the first place, but they find it difficult to process. So we also looked at other aspects of, um, of social processing, and again, this is from the, the BASIS team, so the, the team in London that I now work with. So this is looking at brain activation to faces with eyes gazing towards the baby or gazing away from the baby. And it's looking at the difference in baby's brain activity based on whether the gaze shifts to you or away from you. Um, and again, what they found was that six months infants with later autism show much less difference between those two conditions, basically. So they show much less sensitivity to whether the gaze was shifting towards them or away. So again, they looked at the stimuli equally, but they were doing something different with it while they were looking. And so these results illustrate why we're interested in looking at a sort of brain activity and those kind of things as well as just behavior, because sometimes overt behavior can look quite similar, but when you look at what's happening during that behavior early on, it seems to be quite different. But it's not just social processing that's different. So, so a lot of people in the autism field for a long time thought that we'd see social differences first and then everything else would kind of spring from that. Um, but we actually see a lot of other difficulties, even in these very young infants, that um, map on to some of the difficulties we see in older kids. So motor, motor development is one of the big ones that's been looked at. And again, we see <laughs> right from this age and very subtle differences, um, but some differences in early motor development. So this is a study looking at head lag. So this is with six-month-old babies. If you pull them to sit, they should, <coughs> by this age, be able to hold their head in line with their back. And that both involves motor control of the muscles, but also anticipation of what's going to happen to them when their mom reaches for their arms. And what these researchers did was look at that in infants with later autism, and they found that infants who went on to autism were much more likely to show this kind of pattern, so and really not be able to keep their head in line with their body when they were pulling them to sit. So again, that could be a motor problem, or it could be a problem with anticipating what's going to happen and, and readying yourself for it. But again, it suggests some subtle delays. And generally, these children by, by eight, nine months look, look fine in this measure. So it's something that you see at a fairly restricted time in development. And that's something that is a, a theme across a lot of the stuff that I'm going to talk about, that we might see some of these differences for a very brief period in infancy, and then they go away again. So when we're thinking about early screening or early surveillance, we might need to think about very specific time points and looking at very specific behaviors, just like we would in screening for other types of developmental delay where infants are supposed to progress and so we should look at different behaviours at different ages. There's also some other evidence of differences in motor development. So here we're looking at what infants do during a sort of five to ten minute period of, of playing. So they're basically looking at how often infants spend time in, in three different positions, so lying, sitting and standing. And on the bottom axis, well, I'll see what their age, so six months, nine months, twelve and fourteen months. And what they found was that the infants who went on to autism, there's a small group here, but they were much more likely to be in developmentally immature postures. So much more likely to lie or to sit rather than to stand. We also see delays in walking in a lot of our infants with later autism. So they might walk at 14 months, 15 months. It's not late enough that you'd worry about it, but it's certainly, there's data now to suggest it's slightly later than, than typically developing infants. And so there are various different possibilities, but these kind of motor delays might not, they might, might just signal a sort of vulnerable nervous system, but they might also limit a child's opportunities or slightly reduce a child's opportunities for interaction, because of course if baby's not standing or walking to show you things, often babies that are more difficult, i.e. babies that run around, elicit a lot of attention from parents because you've got to pay attention to them to know where they're going and to control their behaviour. 
Um, and if you have a child who's not doing that, it can seem easier, but actually sometimes they're not eliciting quite so much interaction um, as other children. So some of these early subtle motor delays might might act to constrain or alter a child's experiences of the environment, which might have, um, or at least contribute to some of these cascading influences towards later difficulties. So we also see these sort of subtle delays in reaching and grasping. So this is just looking at six and 10 month olds. And these are just high risk versus low risk infants, so infants with or without an older sibling with autism. But what you find is that at six months, infants with an older sibling with autism were a little bit worse at reaching and grasping and spent a bit less time reaching and grasping when they were playing. Um, by 10 months, again, that difference had completely disappeared. But it might be that for that brief developmental period, that means that, they're, again, they're not getting quite so much input. So perhaps they're not grasping a toy, so mom doesn't label it. So some of these things can have impacts on their early environment in very subtle ways um, that might end up contributing not only to motor difficulties later, but potentially also social communication difficulties. And there are various other physical features in this very <coughs> early time period that, whilst all these other things are subtle, these, the next couple might be potentially things that one could scream for, or at least might give red flags or warning signs. So one is, is head circumference change. And this has been a bit of a, a tortured story. So for a long time, we thought that there was an acceleration in head circumference in infants who went on to autism, probably in this sort of six to 12 month window. So their heads would be growing normally and then they'd accelerate and then they'd go back to the sort of normal trajectory. But you'd end up with a slightly elevated head circumference later on. And so this could reflect brain overgrowth. It could reflect a completely altered pattern of brain development. But then recently there's been um, controversy about that because a couple of large studies haven't replicated it. However, a recent MRI study actually found brain overgrowth. So in MRI scans, they found the actual, the brain of infants with later autism was growing more than um, typically developing infants. So it's hard to know at the moment what the, what the truth is in this story, but it certainly seems like there's some evidence at least that, that, that potentially there's some overgrowth of the brain during this very key developmental window. And indeed, one group actually tried to use this um, as a screening, early screening approach. So they took infants at four, six, and nine months, and they looked for head circumference increases, basically, over that time period. And they also looked at one of these motor signs. This is a slightly different reflex, but again, it's looking at an early reflex that should be there at a certain point in development. And if it's absent, then that can be a red flag. So they looked at 1,000 infants, and they screened for those things, and they found 15 that failed, so I either had a big increase in head circumference or it didn't show this reflex. And they found that 14 out of those 15 kids did retain an autism diagnosis when they were evaluated at three. So it's a small study in terms of how many children were evaluated later and it needs replicating, but at least suggests that some of these early motor differences or physical changes actually might be reasonable ways of identifying at least children who are at <coughs> elevated risk and might need more developmental monitoring. So then, that's the first year. So in the first year, we see lots of subtle disruptions, maybe some clearer things that, that potentially could be useful for early screening. But really, still in the first year, we're only really looking for warning signs. And a lot of the, the findings I talked about are different at the group level, but on an individual level, they're not very predictive. When we get to the, the 12 to 18 month age range, we start talking more about red flags, because we start seeing more behaviors that when you see them, they don't mean that a child's going to develop autism, but there's a much higher probability that there's something um, that needs to be monitored for that child. And so obviously regression is the, the biggest one that you start to sometimes see in this age range or slightly later. Um, but that's a clear red flag that a child should be evaluated for autism if they experience any loss of scale in this, in this kind of time range. But there are others. So in the US, it's quite a different approach, but the CDC, so the, the Center for Disease Control, um, advocate early screening for autism. So they have a set of uh, warning signs on their website that they advocate people look out for. And so these are things like infants not babbling, not gesturing. So these are all the things that should be emerging by 12 months. But if they don't, then that can be a red flag, particularly if more than one of these things isn't happening. Um, response to name is another big one. So what we often see is that infants who go on to autism don't turn to their name. Um, and this is something that came out of early videotapes. We see it in our prospective studies. Um, no pointing to show interest, so kids will point to ask for what they want, but 
around this age, you should start pointing to show mom or dad something interesting in the environment, and infants who are going on towards them often don't. Um, and then no, not talking or not, no single words by 16 months. So interestingly, what we see in some kids with autism is that they'll show very early language or a very early use of words, so eight months, nine months, and then they'll lose that skill again. Whereas others will show this, this pattern of delay where they don't, don't talk at all and it takes them a lot longer. And some kids with autism will learn to talk fine, but then we start noticing alterations in the way they talk or the words that they use later on. So just like there's lots of variability in kids and adults with autism, there's also lots of variability in early trajectories. So some kids will show clear symptoms at 12 months and some won't show any or very few at 12 months, but might by 18 months or two. And then there are other, in addition to these sort of social communication signs, there are other more experimental or um, more tentative things that are starting to be identified. So again, it looks like difficulties aren't just restricted to, to the social domain by, by one. So this is looking at very early examples of, of restricted or repetitive behaviours. So repetitive behaviours are hard to see in infants because typical infants show lots of repetitive behaviours, so it's really hard to distinguish those that are atypical from those that are typical. But, but unusual sensory type behaviours are a little easier to see. So here they were, researchers were giving infants objects that were meant to elicit unusual behaviours, so things that span or things you could look at from unusual angles. And what they found was that in <coughs> pale grey are the kids with later autism, and so they were much more likely to show these sort of unusual visual angles, so they'd look at things from a funny angle or hold it up, look at it from the side, or they'd spin the objects much more, whereas the typically developing children would bang them or chew them or you know, do sort of what look like more typical behaviours with them. And so it seems like some of these sort of unusual sensory behaviours do emerge early, and again that concurs with what a lot of parents say, that that's, that's some of the first things they notice, usually around this age, 12 to 18 months, so they'll notice their child doing unusual sensory things, and that's often um, one of the things that, that makes parents the most concerned in addition to social communication delays. And then another thing that is probably the most replicated finding of this, this whole field, so when we look at 12 month olds with late autism, this is um, an attention shifting task. So, so we know that kids with autism and adults with autism sometimes find it difficult to shift their attention from what they're interested in to something else. Um, and so this is a, a sort of infant-friendly way of looking at that. So we show a baby a, a picture in the middle of the screen, and then a picture comes up to the side, and either the picture comes up to the side and the central picture disappears, or the central picture stays on screen. And in the case where the central picture stays on screen, the child's got to disengage from the central picture and shift their attention to the peripheral, the side picture. And we just measure the length of time it takes them to do that. And what we find is that at seven months, everybody looks the same, sees a typical infant in green and infants with later autism in brown and then other high-risk infants in the middle. And at seven months, everybody's roughly the same, but by 14 months, infants who go on to autism, and these are the same babies, take a lot longer to shift their attention from a central to a peripheral stimulus, and longer than they did at seven months. So we're actually showing this sort of developmental slowing um, over what they should be showing. And this is something that we found in our group. It's been replicated in two groups in the US. We also see the same thing in behavioral coding, so infants take longer to shift um, their visual attention from one object to another. So it seems quite robust. Um, and again, this is the kind of thing you can see how that might constrain your learning opportunities in the world, because you're looking at an object and mom labels something else and it takes you a bit longer to shift or whatever mom's labeling, it's gonna be harder for you to learn the correct word than it is for an infant who can shift more quickly. So there are lots of possibilities for how this might impact early development, um, and we're starting to look at those. But we think that this might be maybe not an early marker in the sense that we can identify children at risk, but it might be something we can use to test the effects of early intervention. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. But the other thing we start seeing at 12 months is differences in, in brain connectivity. So I said that we see this overgrowth between, between six and 12 months, possibly. Well, we, we looked at brain activity at 12 months, and here we're looking at basically how similar the brain activity is between different regions of the brain, which is a measure, an indirect measure of how connected different brain regions might be. And what we found here, again, what we see often in kids and adults with autism, sometimes that there's um, sometimes less connectivity between different regions, which might be related to some of the um, perceptual advantages that people with autism might have. So it might be why you. Um, 
you might see better perceptual sensitivity or better ability to detect perceptual changes in the environment. Um, and so we were expecting to find uh, the same thing in infancy. But actually what we found was that the 12-month infants with later autism, if anything, show greater connectivity. So their brain activity was more similar across the whole scalp than, than other infants. And this is particularly true sort of this section, so frontally to temporally. And the other interesting thing about this data was that it really correlated with their repetitive behaviours. So infants who had much higher levels of connectivity have much higher levels of repetitive behaviours reported by their parents at age three. So it seems to an extent to relate to, to that kind of set of symptoms and relate to their social communication symptoms as strongly. And again, we don't, we don't really know exactly what it means, but it might mean that there's been less pruning. So in typical development, normally what happens is that brain connections that aren't used or redundant get pruned away, and you get left with the connections that are the most efficient. Um, and so it might be that that process, that pruning process, isn't operating properly, and so that could create a, a brain that's more responsive to, to too many things, it could create hypersensitivity. Um, we don't know, but at least it's something that we can start seeing differences in, in networks of brain regions from very early on. So by the time we get to 18 months, we get much more into what looks like a autism in a much older child. And really, for a lot of, well, some kids, we can start making diagnoses from 18 months, more from around 24 months to 36 months. But the symptoms become much more similar to what you would see in an older child. So things like no pretend play, kids will start avoiding eye contact, they play alone, um, being hard to comfort, finding it difficult as they get older to talk about their feelings, all the sorts of things that we see in you know two, three, four year olds who come into the clinic for a diagnosis. Then we get the communication differences, so either delayed speech and language, they might not be talking still by two, three, four, um, or children might be able to talk, but might show a lot of echolalia, reversing pronouns, gestures. And then of course we see the sort of more classic restricted interests and repetitive behaviours. So lining up toys, liking parts of objects, unusual sensory reactions, hyper, hyposensitivity. And a lot of these things that we're seeing in these prospective studies are the same as the things you see when children come into the clinic at 18 months, 24 months. Albeit, often what we see in, in infants with older siblings with autism is that their, their symptoms tend to be milder. They tend to have much stronger cognitive skills. And that's probably partly because we're, we're looking for these children. We're, we're not waiting for them to come in from the community where often the children who are experiencing more symptoms and have poorer cognitive skills are going to be picked up earlier, just naturally. But it also might be that some of the, the sort of more single gene causes of autism that, that don't tend to be our, our sort of familial groups, they tend to sometimes be more severe or be more severely affected. And so these kind of family cases where there's a, a, a constellation of different variants that might coalesce to create autism, um, sometimes the, the, the children we see are, are less affected really than, than other kids would be. So that's one caveat from some of the prospective work that we do, that we might be looking at a slight subset of kids with autism that might not cover the, the full range. So I just thought I'd finish by talking about the practical side. So what we want to do is take some of these findings and turn them into actual change that, that can be implemented in, in the community. And the two main prongs of that are early screening or surveillance and early intervention. <laughs> Um, so there have been a number actually of different screening advances recently, so ways of finding kids in the community showing risk factors. Simon Baron Cohen's got a really nice screening measure for 18 month olds, I think he's going to be reporting some nice data on soon. Um, this is a, another one from an Australian group that we work with, but it's called the, the SACSAR, which is a social attention and communication scale. But this is a, something that health visitors do basically at regular mom-child visits. And so health visitors are often good at these things because of course they see such a wide variety of kids and so they can pick out the kids that look different or develop differently over time. Um, and this measure was tested in a large population sample, so 22,000 kids in Australia. And it's what we call a surveillance approach. So as I was saying, the, the trajectories of, of infants who go on to autism are very variable, just like kids with autism can be very variable. And so some infants will show symptoms very early and so you want to be able to pick those infants up early and provide them with perhaps earlier support or at least earlier monitoring. Whereas other infants you would miss if you tried to screen them early because they don't show clear symptoms until they're 18 months or two, especially if they've, they've regressed. 
So this approach sees children at 8, 12, 18 and 24 months and, and refers children at every time point who need referring. Um, and what they found was that they had a 1% referral rate, which is what you'd expect based on the sort of population prevalence of autism. And about 80% <coughs> of those children had autism when they assessed them later in development. Um, and the remainder had other developmental delays, or language delay, or other social problems. So it seems at least like a promising approach, and this is being adopted now in a number of different regions in Australia, and also a number of European countries, so Poland starting to use this as a way of identifying children for earlier monitoring or early or in support services. So I think there's some there's some promise in the, at least the behavioural screeners. So we're a long way from having EEG and eye tracking measures that we can put into the clinic, but but certainly behaviourally we've come a long way forward. And so basically the SACS looks for different numbers of key items, and so if you fail, if you if you, the child's not showing three out of five of them, um, they're referred. So they're things like, we talked about the pointing and eye contact and waving, imitating and responding to name, and then as the children get older, you start looking for things like pretend play and showing. Um, and so that's had very good performance in a number of different studies now. So then the, the last thing, of course, is that when we've identified children, we need to have options for families as to what you do when you've identified a child who, who might be at risk. And so there's a number of different groups looking at intervention, but we've um, recently trialled a couple of, of different interventions. So one we call the iBASIS program, and this is led by Jonathan Green in, in Manchester. But this was an intervention for infants with older siblings with autism. Um, so what we sometimes call high-risk babies, which isn't the best phrase, I don't think, but we haven't got any better. Um, and so the idea behind this intervention is that infants who are going on to autism or, or at heightened risk for autism might not be showing exactly the same kind of communicative signals to mom or to dad as a typically developing infant would do. So they might be showing much more subtle signs, they might show this pattern of attention where they look and look away quickly. So the parent might need to adjust their behaviour to catch those signals and provide a much more enriched environment so that even if the child's missing 90% of social cues, the 10% is still enough for them to learn. And so that was the idea behind this intervention. And so um, the, the therapists work with families showing parents basically videos of them interacting with their baby and trying to help them see the, the altered cues that their child was providing. Um, and so we found that this, we just trialled it with 50, 50 infants, a very small group, 25 got the intervention, 25 didn't. And it did seem to help infant social skills. And it also changed performance on this attention disengagement task I was talking about. So the babies who got the intervention were actually showed much faster attention shifting than infants who didn't. So we think at least it suggests it's a, a promising approach and we need to look at it in bigger samples to know whether or not it really worked. Um, but we think it's promising. And it also suggests that some of these what we might call biomarkers, some of these EEG and eye tracking measures might help us understand what interventions are effective earlier than we can do something like the ADOS or you know a diagnostic scale that, that we can't do until infants are three, four or five. Then the, the latest um, intervention that we're, we're trying at the moment is using an eye tracker as actually an intervention tool. So here we use infrared light to measure what babies are looking at. What we're doing is presenting babies with little games on a computer. And so if babies look at certain things on the screen, something happens. So they look at the star with the character and it spins around, they get a reward. And what they've got to do, the game gets harder and harder, they've got to find the characters in that display. And then there are various other games where they have to maintain their attention or shift their attention. And essentially they're getting rewarded for, for using attentional control. What we can show is in that in typically developing infants, they, they get better over time, and they get better in terms of controlling their attention on things like the attention shifting tasks. Their attention shifting gets faster. And so what we're doing right now is we're starting with a group of infants at risk for ADHD, so infants with older siblings with ADHD, to look at whether or not these games can help attentional control in those babies. But then our next step is to look at infants at risk for autism to see whether or not we can change some of these attention variables to help infants boost their attention skills, which might help them at least use those skills to, to develop more social and communication opportunities to learn. And there are lots of other sort of innovative things people are doing. So this is, we call them sticky mittens. So you give the kid a mitten with Velcro on it. And so when they're at that age, when they can't reach and, reach and grasp very well, they can still reach out with their sticky mitten and grab the toys and so you stick some fluffy stuff on the toys. 
And the idea behind it is that you can help infants explore their world even if they've got problems with reaching and grasping. So there are lots of little things like this that, that are, are being developed that ultimately we hope we can put together as a package to target lots of the individual difficulties that infants might have um, to try and help them boost their development a little bit early on. So I'm just going to finish by talking about where, where we're going now and where the field's going now. So as Liz said, what, what I do mainly is coordinate our, um, what we call our EURASIB, or EU AIM study. So this is a multi-site study of infants with older siblings with autism. Because of course a lot of the data I've talked about comes from quite small groups of kids. And we know there's a lot of variability in kids with autism, so we really want to put together big samples so we can understand not only what predicts autism as a category, but what predicts individual development for kids. And so this is a study that involves researchers in Sweden and the Netherlands, uh, Belgium and Poland and us, um, all working on the same kind of protocol, collecting data from infants with older siblings with autism that we can then put together and start to ask questions that are more nuanced about some of these early markers. And we were also part of a big collaboration called the UAMS, which is um, the largest ever autism grant. Um, but there were lots of other parts of the UAMS grant, but there's a large study of adults and kids with autism. So again, looking at collecting data from, I think, 600 people to understand variability. And we should be able to then map some of our measures from infancy right through the, the lifespan. And the other direction that we're pursuing more locally in our centre is trying to understand whether these markers are specific to, to autism. So if we just look at infants at risk for autism, it can look like some of these, these things are markers for autism, but actually they might just relate to any type of developmental difficulty or, or variability. So what we're doing now is comparing infants at risk for autism with infants with older siblings with ADHD. Because of course ADHD is very co-occurrent with autism, a lot of people with autism have ADHD. Um, and we think that there might be some sort of shared risk pathways, but on the other hand, it's a very distinct disorder. So we're looking at whether or not some of our markers might relate to autism and ADHD, or might relate independently, might relate to ADHD within autism. Um, and that's the study that we call our STARS study. So this is what we're running right now. Um, so babies come to our baby lab, and we use all of those measures that I talked about before to look at their early development. That's it. So just to summarise, we, we see markers or early signs of autism across a range of domains, so not just social problems early on, but social problems, motor problems. And they were all very subtle very early on, so they wouldn't necessarily be something you would worry about if you saw it, but, but together we're starting to see some very early slight disruptions um, that later on become more significant. And there's some evidence of contextual risk, so some environmental and genetic risk factors early, but we still don't know how those, those risk factors translate into those later behaviours. By 12 to 18 months, we see these much clearer red flags, so then we can start to identify children who might need more monitoring. And by 18 to 24 months, then diagnosis becomes a lot more possible, although there's still a massive gap between that and when realistically diagnoses usually get given um, in many countries. And that's something that we need to address. And something that might be helpful are these sort of surveillance approaches that, that are currently being developed. So just to finish, there's, there are some, the CDC has a nice list of, of signs if people are interested in the, the different signs at different ages. And there's a really nice video glossary on the Autism Speaks website that has little videos of babies showing typical behaviours and then babies showing early signs of autism that really clarifies some of the behaviours that, that I talked about. And just to say thank you, this is our team in London, but we have a whole team across Europe. Um, but these are the people involved in all of our studies. Thank you very much, Emily. That was really, really informative and interesting.